Welcome everybody. I am Rabbi Scott Kamakoff, the coordinator for the Union for Traditional Judaism. We're excited that you're here with us this evening for our three-part series, History of the Talmud with Rabbi Dr. Ari Bergman. Uh, before we begin, uh, I just wanna mention again that this program is being recorded. And I would also like to ask everybody to please save your questions for the end of the presentation. There will be time at the end for Q and A. Also, before we begin, I would like to thank our sponsors who are sponsoring this program. Our benefactors, Josh Eisen and Rabbi Gerald Sussman and Bonita Nathan Sussman in honor of Rabbi Dr. David Weiss Olivni. Our partners, Kihilat Moshe of Southern Brooklyn, Rabbi Shlomo Siegel, their rabbis on the call this evening. They are partnering with us uh, with the Union for Traditional Judaism to bring this uh, program to you. Our supporter, Gabrielle Newman, in honor of Rabbi David Weiss Olivni and our friends, Edward Bromberg, Rabbi Kenneth Green, in memory of his father, Mordechai Yehuda Ben Benyamin, Mitch Morrison, who is sponsoring in honor of Rabbi David Novak and his wonderful teachings and friendship. Mitch Morrison, again, in honor of Rafa Livni for his courage, resilience, and timeless contributions to Torah. Michael Shavelson, Barry Scher, in memory of Arthur J. Zweibel, MD. Karen Rafalowitz and Bernie Rotman, in recognition of UTJ. I am going to share uh, the list of sponsors in the chat. Um, and now I'm going to hand things over to Rabbi Gerald Sussman, the executive vice president of UTJ, who's going to introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, tonight is a very special evening because we are honored to have the rarest of people, a true Talmud Chacham, who is also an accomplished business person, Rabbi Dr. Ari Bergman. Ari is a frequent lecturer at Yeshiva University and popular scholar in residence at many shuls across the greater New York, New Jersey area. Ari Bergman is also the founder and managing principal of Penso Advisors, LLC, a New York-based global macro and risk management boutique specializing in derivatives, structuring, trading, and systematic risk mitigation. Prior to founding the firm in 1997, Dr. Bergman was a senior managing director at Bankers Trust. Ari received his bachelor in Talmudic literature from Nair Yisrael Rabbinical College in 1981 and furthered his graduate studies at many prestigious yeshivot in Israel. He holds an MA and PhD in comparative religion from Columbia University, where he studied with professors Yosef Chaim Yerushalmi and David Weiss Halivni, who was also his doctoral advisor. Ari is an adjunct professor at Yeshiva University and before coming to YU, he taught at Columbia University and at the University of Pennsylvania. His book, The Formation of the Talmud, Scholarship and Politics in Yitzchak, in Yitzchak Isaac Halevi's The Road Harishonim was just published by the Greeter in February, 2021. Ari lectures extensively in Israel Brazil, Europe, and the U.S. on topics of finance, Talmud, and Jewish thought. And we at the Union for Traditional Judaism consider ourselves uh, the disciples of scholars such as Alivni. So therefore, we are more than happy to welcome him and are very excited to hear this presentation. Okay, hi, good evening to everybody and welcome. It's a great pleasure to be here tonight and with uh, such a distinguished audience. And um, for me, it's very special to be speaking at UTJ because this, uh, this lesson and my whole development study, the Talmud in academic sense is due to Professor Livni. Shlita. And uh, so tonight's lecture and the whole series is in his honor, therefore to somebody that I owe so much, and uh, hopefully you enjoy and make it interesting and exciting 
And again, at the end of the presentation, you have time to ask questions. I would love to hear your gosh, questions, comments, etc. Okay? So we are going to start, as you'll see, the history of the Talmud. And the question is, what's at stake and why should we care? And why, why is it important to know the history of the Talmud? And the reason I'm mentioning is, is because David Weiss Alivni, Professor Alivni, I encountered at Columbia University and was actually by own chance, right? I was supposed to be studying under Yosef Chaim Rishalmi. I got accepted to the master's program and Yosef Chaim Rishalmi was in the sabbatical. And then I saw the professor Livni was giving a class and it was love at the first sight. And professor, the, the professor Livni always believed in his whole, I think, approach is based how the value of history, of studying the history of the Talmud has such an important and foundational impact. I actually did my master's with Professor Yerushalmi, and then when the time came for the PhD, I had the choice of doing perhaps one in Jewish history with Yerushalmi or on the Talmud with Professor Livni, and I chose, and I'm very happy for my choice, to do Professor Livni. And what I decided to focus on is precisely on the Rota Rishonim, right? The Rota Rishonim, we... Professor Levin and I always said, this is Cafe Rimon in Israel, is a street called Rot Rishonim. We believe this Rot Harishonim really goes on to uh, Halevi. Yitzchak Isaac Halevi, he was the historian of the Talmud on the traditional sense because he was a huge, great Talmudist. Wrote on, really, he wrote a comprehensive history on the, on the formation of the Talmud. And Professor Levin inspired me to actually write and study his approach. The first class, he said, Ari, if you want to know what's going on, because the first time I heard about the Stamaim, I was after shocked. I'm a regular yeshiva guy, right? Went to yeshiva and the Stamaim were people came like from outer space. So I was really <laughs> very impressed. And he says, Ari, if you want to really, really appreciate that, you should study the Rotary Shonim. So Professor Livni actually inspired me to learn the Rotary Shonim. And his whole approach was there is very great value in understanding and knowing the history of the Talmud. So tonight we're going to discuss about what's at stake. Why is it so important, the history of the Talmud? When did it come about? And that was Professor Livni saying that, listen, the, one of the traditional only traditional voices who really spent and devoted so much time and effort to it is Yitzchak Isaac Alevi, which Professor Livni saw as his quote-unquote Baal Machlok, his counterpart, his intellectual counterpart. He always saw himself in a conversation with Rabbi Yitzchak Isaac Alevi. And my dissertation is actually comparing and contrasting these two Bali Plukta, these two people, which is Halevi and Halivni. Their names sound the same and it's fascinating because their biography, as we'll see next time, is also very similar in some ways. And my whole dissertation is to prove that as much as they are arguing with each other, they are very complementary to each other. So that's a fascinating story and we'll discuss that. But let's start with the process. Now, the history of the Talmud, who wrote about it? So it's amazing that this has not been a question. The Talmud has been learned for thousands of years, at least at least more than a thousand years, and very few people discussed about it. History has not been an important, and the question is why not? Now we know that the Talmud does not talk about its own creation. It says only one cryptic comment in Baba Mitzvah 86a, which is part of a narrative that says Ravashi Veravina Sofora. Ravashi and Ravina are the end of Hora. We're going to see that the word Hora is not clear that if it refers to the Talmud, because Hora really means teaching or rulings, but nothing else. That's it. What does that mean? Now, Yerushalmi, Professor Yerushalmi, in his seminal work, Zahor, talks about why history has never been something that we, the traditional community or the Jewish community was focused on. We are very focused on remembering, on memory, but memory is this constructed idea of our past. And that's what we care. We care about memory, but history has not been something that was actually written, discussed. Historiography was not a quote unquote Jewish 
profession. And we know that this only changed, as Yerushalmi writes, in the 16th century as a result, perhaps of various reasons, perhaps because of the breathing blast or perhaps because of the expulsion, which means the expulsion from Spain, or perhaps other reasons. But the real issues before were not. Now, what we had about the Talmud, so the Talmud, there's no history. Here is a book that everybody learns and has been part of the Jewish community for so long, and its history. The book doesn't tell you how it came about. Neither the people who learned it had any interest in the topic, which is amazing, right? Now, what do we have? What are the sources available to us? The basic source available to us are the chronologies. We didn't have history, but we had chronologies. Chronologies are called the Shalshelet Kabbalah. Shalshelet Kabbalah are basically the traditions to say who got it, how they get it. It's basically a chain of people connecting the Bavli, the Talmud, to a direct chain to, to Sinai. So that's a chronology. So the first one is Seder Tanaim Vamoraim, which of the ninth century of the common era, perhaps written in Surah, but it's very cryptic. And as Brody, Robert Brody, already who is the expert in the Gunim, says already that this chronology is very corrupted. In other words, that so many pieces and probably is a collection. Probably we lost and they collected several manuscripts, so it doesn't even flow. Repeats and goes back, but that's the earliest chronology. But Halevi, which was a great historian, as I told you, the counterpart of Halivni, was of the view that it's not reliable. Even he says, to not even the chronology is not reliable, very cryptic, and the text basically has tons of mistakes. So where, what's the first chronology of the Talmud that we could rely on, right? Because there's nothing, there's no materials. So it is the Gerrit Shriragon. Rav Shiragon, the Gaon of Pumpedita in 986E, his entry back to the people in Kirwan were very interested in knowing who are the people, how the Talmud came about. And he creates a chronology. It is a chronology. So it's not a history, right? There's no process. But he has very important pieces of information that we have to deal with. And we are going to see throughout our presentations the historians, do they come to explain they get it, or they come to argue that they get it. Now, you realize that they get it is 986 in the 10th century of the common era, right? Pretty far removed from when the Talmud was taking place. We realize that the Talmud begins his history in the 3rd century, right? When Rab arrives in, in Babylonia. So, but, but that's what we have. And we had also Sefer Kabbalah of derived, which is called Imdod, in uh, the 12th century. But that's already much later, and he relies a lot on Sefer Kabbalah. Uh, Sefer Kabbalah relies a lot on Shiragon and in some other traditions that he found around. But that's it. Those are the basically chronologies, no history. History was never an issue. And the question is, why not? And what's at stake? So. If, if they didn't care about Israel, should we care? And this is something that we're going to devote our first series to decide. If till the year, to, to the, who knows, to the, I will see the 19th century, this was not such a topic. Why is it so important for us to know the history of the Talmud? What's at stake? And why is it relevant? Now, let's talk about the history of the Talmud. History is a tool of interpretation. I think that Professor Halivni, what he always inspired in his students, and we have Josh Eisen here, I think, is in tonight's audience, is the concept that the history of the Talmud allows you to have the right interpretation. If you understand of the formation of the Talmud, how the Talmud came about, you could understand interpretation. You could understand why some answers are given and many questions that people ask on the Talmud make no sense, because if you understand what the Talmud is all about, in other words, the history of the Talmud teaches us what the Talmud is all about. The Talmud is not a book that was written. It's not. It's a work that was formed over a long period of time. I always say this is the first Wikipedia ever in time, because what's unique about the Talmud? As you will see, the Talmud is a collective book. You realize that we are the Halal Kitab, right? Meaning even the, even 
the Quran believes that we are the people of the book with the revelation. But you realize that from the year, from the third century, from when the Rav comes to Babylonia in the year 216, all the way to the end of the eighth century, there were no individual works. There were no individual works. Nothing. We were quiet. It's called the quiet period because the community spoke in a communal voice through the Talmud. And the Talmud, you'll see, comes into that period, which is, we'll see, there was a big debate if it was a period of 300 years or 600 years or perhaps 800 years on a communal voice. So if you understand the process, you can understand the book is. And then interpretation makes sense. You cannot give interpretation to a book if you don't know what the book is all about. And the book is all about, is only a process of how it was formed. You can't understand, it's not a work that was written. And the projection that we have, it's a mistake. So Halivni is the one who says, we can create interpretation and meaning through history. And that it was Halivni brought to us and brought to me. That was, I think, the moment, I would say the Eureka moment at Columbia, that I saw that I was in the presence of somebody so special is because Halivni combined a Talmudist, which is great knowledge. Because the Talmud, if you look back, right, it's an awesome work. 2,000 folios with many concepts, legal concepts of a myriad of discussions of legal topics and the narratives. It talks about science, it's about folklore. So you have to be a Talmudist to understand the text. But if you believe that history is a tool of interpretation, you need to be a historian also. So you become basically, you need two areas of expertise and combining the two together. And I think the Professor Halivni was the one who inspired me to look at history as a tool of interpretation. And we are going to show you how this is very cool. That if you know the history of the Talmud, you could interpret it much better. You could understand it much better. You could appreciate it much better. And you could remember it much better. Now, uniquely enough, the Rotary Shonim, which is Halevi, which was the great Halevi wrote, Yitzchak Isaac Halevi, we're going to talk about him tonight because Halivni saw him as his, as I told you before, his Baal Plukta, his Baal Machloket, precisely because of that. Because he also saw the value of combining history with Talmud learning. A Talmudist historian gives a perspective that very few other people, if any, have. And that's very unique. Because you'll see even Shama Friedman, which is also, as we're going to see, in some ways, a counterpart to Halivni. Professor Halivni never saw that. And the reason is because he did not combine history. And the unique part of history as a tool of interpretation is because you need to be a Talmudist to appreciate that. So all the historians, Jewish historians, are many times not equipped and that's what I say in my book. If you look at Gretz, at Hirschweiss, and all of these people, they're great historians, at least in the beginning, Salberon, but they could not really add much value because they're no Talmudists. On the other side, you have great Talmudists on the traditional sense, we all know that, but even the academic sense, Shama Friedman and his school, which are terrific, but they were not historians. So Professor Livni combined. So I think that's the first thing of tonight. And now the reason why that's important is because when you read a text, you have to know how you explain. We know that in constitutional interpretation, we have various approaches. We have something called original intent, that when you interpret the constitution, when we interpret any document, you have to go to the head of the people who wrote. What did they mean? What was their original intent? For that, you clearly need to have history, because otherwise you don't know who they are. How the heck are you going to think what they know if you don't know who they are? And even if you are a Scalian of Scalia, and you hold that the way to interpret text is through originalism, it's not what the framers of the Constitution thought, but how people read the text at that time. In other words, it's not a function of the intent of the writer, but the intent of the reader, originalism. We know that our Supreme Court right? The conservatives are big fans of originalism. Again, you need to know what is this document, how it came about, who were the first readers of it? 
And even if you hold of Lisbon Constitution, that is a living document that gets reinterpreted, you still need to know history to know what is document. So history makes sense as interpretation. And if you look at how today we interpret the US Constitution, right? No matter the schools of interpretation, original intent on one extreme or living constitution on the other extreme, the history of the document is so important. So history as a tool of interpretation is not only how living this approach, which is something in our schools of academic interpretation, which is constitutional interpretation, history has a role. If it's original intent, it is funda fundamental. If it's originalism, it's also extremely important, but even on the living constitution theory and doctrine, that's also important. And that's why we, by knowing history, you're going to see that you'll be able to appreciate how the Talmud combines uniquely tradition and innovation, tradition and creativity. You're going to see how the Talmud, because it evolved, once you understand the history of the Talmud and the dynamics of it, we can appreciate how the Talmud juggles and balances between tradition and innovation, tradition and creativity. So history, besides allowing for interpretation, also allows us to create a very, I think, deep understanding of how tradition, and innovation were balanced over hundreds of years. Because you realize, right, the, once you understand the history of the Talmud, the process, you realize that it's not linear. It's all, as I told you, the Wikipedia is a great example for such a thing. It's an organic document that developed for so much time. Then you could balance tradition and innovation. Now, this is the importance of history, and that's, I think, what Professor Livni brought to us. But on the community as a whole, history became an important tool for the community basically in the 19th century. We know that history came into the universities brought by Leopold Ranke. Leopold Ranke was the Wissenschaft, the scientific study of history, and that penetrated universities, and that became part of the Wissenschaft, the Judentums, meaning it became part of the science of Judaism that became a very much an area of interest. So in the 19th century, history becomes very important in the Jewish community because it becomes a tool of a non-rabbinic approach to Judaism. That's number one. And number two, as you'll see, Geiger and a lot of the reformers to try to use history to basically allow for the reformation of Judaism. So history becomes, I told you, in the beginning, the first step is history is very important. But history became a topic. We know that history before the 19th century didn't exist, didn't make sense of the community. As much as Professor Levy just told you that history is important to understand the text, to give you interpretation, history was not a topic in the world community, people did not see this as a science until the 19th century. In the 19th century, Report Ranking in Germany introduces to the universities and the community adopts it. And that was adopted again as the science of Judaism, but was also adopted as a way of with an agenda. And then becomes the issue of history becomes very contentious because the struggle against reform. So if you look at Halevi in the Rotary Shonim, is the history of Judaism in defense of traditionalism, which in itself is a different story. So history, as important as it is, became very relevant in the 19th century, but became very controversial because it was used as a tool to basically challenge the traditional view. So you see that as much as history was important, and in the 19th century becomes real, there was naturally a great opposition. We all know that the for Hirsch in Frankfurt said history doesn't apply to Jews. We live in a meta history. So it took time for history to, because he saw that history was just an attempt to undermine tradition. The world evolved in the 19th century and the Rotary Shonim was the book that said, no, no, history is great is valuable, it's important, and does not need to undermine traditional Judaism. So the first attempt to really take history that finally was entering the community and use it as a tool of interpretation is Dorota Rishonim, who was a great Talmudist and at the same time a historian. So this idea of the importance of history 
never was relevant before the 19th century, became very controversial. And the Rotary Shonim was the first one who said, you know something, it's very accepted, acceptable, doesn't have to have an agenda of reforming or discarding the Talmud. That's not it. And you could use it as a sort of interpretation. That's why Professor Livni always saw the Rotary Shonim as a counterpart to it. Now, what are the issues? When you go into the history of the Talmud, I thought it's very important to understand the document. But more than that is also important, to not only the history, and that's the, before the slides that you just saw, history tells you what the document is, to appreciate interpretation and to appreciate how the Talmud juggles between tradition and innovation. But there's another issue. What's the authority of the Talmud? Why is the Talmud authoritative? What is supreme about the Talmud that makes it a supreme work? And the big issue is the history of the Talmud allows you to appreciate what's the authority of the Talmud. Is the Talmud a tops down authority or is it a bottoms up? In other words, is the Talmud promulgated or is the, promul or is the Talmud a natural, organic kind of a book that it came out? It's an emergent work. I think that this is so important to understand the history of the Talmud because it allows a person to appreciate the authority of the Talmud. And let me explain to you what the issue is. We know that the Rambam, right? Maimonides in Perak Beit, in the second Perak of Rambam, says the following, that a, one of the Gimel Midot, one of the ways of the exegetical tools of creating Drashot, Technically, any subsequent court can challenge an earlier interpretation. And it doesn't have to be bigger. The Pasuk says, You should go to the judge of that time, which means that it could evolve. You could have somebody arguing and uh, moving on. So the Kesev says, Why can't we argue the Talmud? Why don't you can't argue the Talmud? And we know that the Talmud says that the Amoraim cannot argue the Tanaim. The Talmud has to go through a lot of work to try to reconcile the Amoraim to the Tanaim because they technically they can't argue. And the question is, why not? So says the Kesev Kvar Kiblo Aleim, this is a communal decision not to argue the Talmud. And everybody asks, Communal decision, who cares? What is it? It's a nether. What is it exactly? And this becomes very important to understand the authority of the Talmud, the supreme authority. How does it come? And it's important to understand the history of the Talmud. Because the big question is the following. In the 19th century, when the history of the Talmud comes about, this question of authority becomes a big issue. So in the traditional sense, Rabbi Honon Wasserman in his school, he says the following, and he says something fantastic. He says the Talmud, if you look at this history, it was a work that was composed by the school of Ravashi, which was a supreme authoritative bidin, a court. And that court had the value and the significance and the authority of the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem. And the Sanhedrin, nobody can argue. You need another Sanhedrin to argue. So the authority of the Talmud is based and predicated upon the supreme body that actually enacted the Talmud. It's a tops down model. Now, Rebel Horn Wasserman is a problem, right? Because you know the Sanhedrin, the Gemara says, right, you know the Sanhedrin has to be sitting in Lishkat Gazit, meaning Sanhedrin is not 71 people out there. You can't just vote for them. They were nominated in the process, but the Gemara says, Hamakom Gorev, you need to be sitting in the temple in a special area to get basically almost the uh, the Ruach HaKodesh, like this guided spirit of the Beit HaMikdash. So how can Ravashi in Babylonia have the same authority? So he comes out with this idea. He says, the only reason you needed to have the people sitting in Jerusalem in the temple is because there were only a court of 71 people. But if you have a court that basically represents the Jewish rabbinical establishment that creates this collective voice, it has the importance and the authority of the Sanhedrin, no matter where they are. 
they become like the real sun dream. In other words, the only reason you need 70, you need, the only reason you need to be in the Beta Middash because it's 71. But the Bavli, the beauty is Ravashi, includes all the sages. He was the representation is he got all the sages of his time. That's why Maimonides, in his introduction to the Mishneh Torah, says that was a unique situation. The Babylonia basically collected all the rabbis together. But it's there predicated upon the Bavli being promulgated. Now, this issue, it's a very important function of the history of the Talmud. Was the Talmud ever convened by an assembly of rabbis? Halevi, in his Dorot Rishonim, as a historian, he tries to prove from the text and from history, that's my book that I just published, which we're going to discuss in the third class. He says, yes, I can show you that there was such a conclave of rabbis. The history of the Talmud is that there was a group of rabbis that represented the entire rabbinic institution from Babylonia and from Palestine. And Ravash was powerful enough to gather such a body and they promulgate it. It's a top cell model. The history of the Talmud then becomes critical because you have to prove that such a thing took place. Otherwise, what's authority? So now the history is not only a tool of interpretation. In the 19th century, history became also a tool of authority of the Babli. Now, at that time, the Chazonish, we all know, and of Cook. In Rita, the Haklai argued with it vehemently. He said, no, 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 no. The Talmud is an emergent system. If the community as a community, when the community is together, accepts something, it vests authority, and that authority, Maimonides himself says, in that same Perek Beit of Ilchot Mamrim, that if there is a Takana, if there is a decree that spreads through the community, that decree is immutable. You cannot challenge. So here they say the authority of the Talmud was precisely because it emerged as a document that was totally underwritten and accepted by the community. It's a emergent document. Again, history makes a lot of sense because the question is, is there such a thing? How did it come about? Now history becomes again a tool of authority. So history is important of authority. And that's why the big question that we need to ask when you study the history of the Talmud, the ceiling of the Talmud, was it organic, an emergent system, or deliberate? Was there an authority tops down? Because it becomes also a very big issue in the community, right? What in the community, the Jewish community, what drives? Is it an authority of a rabbi, a conclave of rabbis, they decided they promulgate, the people listen to it? Or is it communal acceptance, a Jungian kind of an approach of this collective subconscious? This collective subconscious that the community accepts. The history of the Talmud becomes extremely important to understand authority, the authority of the Bavli and how things gain authority throughout generations. So what we come out is the history has, number one, authority. Number two, roles of interpretation, right? The role of interpretation, how to interpret, how Talmud was interpreted. History is paramount. The combination between a Talmudist and a historian to allow the Talmud to be understood and appreciated and explained. But not only that, how to view the authority of the Talmud, which is the work of rabbinic Judaism. Now, Halivni was not the first one who came up with this. The first one who came up, this combination, these two issues, right, that become center focus is two works that I know that realized the importance and the issue and the significance of history. The first one is Dorota Shunim Baritzka Kazika Levi. As you know, as I explained to you, in the 19th century, there was a resurgence of Jewish history because of Leopold Renke. Henry Gratz, The History of the Jews, was the first work and was extremely popular, right? Extremely popular in Yeshivot. People in Yeshivot who didn't care about history basically went crazy on Gratz. Gratz was translated into Hebrew, into a book called Divrei Me Israel by Shapar, by Pinchas Rabinowitz. And it was extremely popular. 
And then came out somebody called Isaac Hirschweiss in Dor Dor Vedoshavn. He was a great rabbi, a big scholar. He actually wrote Svarim, but then he decided to become a historian. And he writes the history of the rabbis, Dor Dor Vedoshavn, became super popular, six editions. But Dor Dor Vedoshavn had an extra grind. And he, again, does not combine the two. They were focused on history. They never came to go ahead and combine the two. Now, at the time, there was the Volozhin Yeshiva, the very well known Yeshiva, and Rabchaim Brisker, everybody knows Rabchaim Brisker, is the creator and the founder of the analytical model. Rabchaim Brisker's best friend, probably, was Yitzchok Isaac Alevi. So he was really London, a real Talmudist, right? He was from Volozhin. He was the Gabbai of Volozhin. He was Reb Chaim Brisker's great friend. So he was a Talmudist with every credential possible. He actually wrote a great book. And he decided to focus in something called Kochmat Israel. Kochmat Israel becomes the parallel of this and Shav de Judem tools, right? This Germany, uh, the idea of the science of Judaism in history in the more Jewish religious sense. And he combines the historian and the Talmudist combination. So he is the first one who sees that. And his focus on the Rotary Shonim, you see, is on the issues I just told you. Authority, interpretation. Authority, interpretation, and the combination between tradition and innovation. This becomes, this is the agenda of the book. Now, he thought that the way to understand the Talmud, they want to appreciate the authority, and the way to understand of how tradition balances with innovation, History is paramount. Now, Rav Cook was his great friend also. He is a very interesting person, right? Exactly, right? He was this Talmudist, the Brisker method, right? In Volodzhin, but he was very close to Rav Cook also. And Rav Cook said, you know, something. Halevi tried to use that also as apologetics to justify the Talmud and to justify it. He wanted to use history, besides what I just told you, also as a tool of apologetics. And that Rav Kook argued with him. He says, you don't need to be apologetics. And the Chazunish, this book becomes very controversial because the Chazunish throughout the generation said, you know something, forget about printing it again. So it's interesting that in Yeshivot, the Rotary Shonim had an impact and that disappeared <laughs> because the Chazunish told the people, if you read my book and we're going to discuss in the third chapter, it appears to me that the Chazunish suppressed the book. So it appeared to me like the traditional schools were going against history. So the history is like this pendulum, right? History becomes a big part of the traditional Ichvot, Yitzchak Isaac Alevi, and then goes back. But you see, that's not the case. So this is Yitzchak Isaac Alevi. Interestingly enough, Yitzhak Isaac Alevi, this is his matzeva. I actually went to see his matzeva, and his matzeva is written in beautiful Hebrew. And I thought to myself, if you read the Rotary Shalim, the Rotary Shalim has a very difficult Hebrew. So clearly he did write his own matzeva, but who wrote it? It's such poetic Hebrew. So I found out from the letters that I did in my book, you'll see Rav Kook wrote the matzeva. So here is interesting that Yitzchok Isaac Alevi has Rav Kook writing in Matzeva, and this becomes the combination, which I'm going to show you is that Yitzchok Isaac Alevi Dorot Shonim is fantastic. And that's why Professor Alevi always saw him as his counterpart. Professor Alevi Alivni told me, Ari, and see, Rubinstein in, in Professor Alivni's book, Formation of the Talmud, you know, that came out, he says, who is, who was he, who was he talking to? Who was his counterpart? Only Halevi. So Halevi and Halivni are the two who combine these things, and that's so unique, people. And you see that appears to be that the Chazonish was against it, and I'm going to show you, in my book I'll show you, and we're going to talk about the third series, that's not true. I think the Chazonish also, and of course, both agreed that history helps you in the issues I just told you. You cannot appreciate and understand the Talmud. You cannot explain it right. You cannot understand its authority. You cannot understand the dynamics between tradition, and innovation, and creativity unless you know the history. And I don't think the Chazunish argued with that. We are going to discuss about that in detail in the third class. But what I want to show you is something very fascinating in this last couple of minutes. The history of the Talmud also becomes a tool of politics. I just told you, it's cool that history helps you understand the Talmud, appreciate the Talmud, levels of authority, and tradition and innovation. But it becomes a political tool. The history of the Talmud creates a political tool that actually 
רבי יצחק קייזק הלוי מדורות הראשונים, not only he was a Talmud, he's an historian, he became a politician, he is the founder and the creator of אגודת ישראל. And אגודת ישראל, it's his idea, and it's all based on the history of the Talmud. So the history of the Talmud becomes a political document. So you realize that combining the history of the Talmud not only gives you authority, interpretation, but gives you a level of a political manifesto. And look at what he did, right? Halevi goes with Rosenheim. Rosenheim is the founder of the Aguda. They create in Bad Hamburg a idea of collecting the rabbis, of creating a unified orthodox political party, right? In Katowice is the first of the meeting when the Aguda was established. And they create something called the Muetzin Gdolea Torah. Everybody heard the Council of the Torah Sages. That the Council of the Torah Sages has this political, this idea of creating, establishing policies. You know, in Israel, right? You see that if you look at Israel, right? The Muetzin Gdolea Torah and everybody who listens to this, where did he get this idea? No question, he saw it in the history of the Talmud. Halevi envisioned the Talmud to, as you will see, discuss, to be a top-down authority. Ravashi creates this conclave of rabbis. So he realizes that this conclave of rabbis created the Talmud. So this is a body that can create law and can create dictum, dicta, and etc. So therefore, he models, as you'll see, and we're going to see in the third class, he models that Moetzik Dolea Torah on his imagination, his image of how the Talmud came about. And you realize that Rab Chaim Brisker, he was a real Brisker, Rab Chaim Brisker was his good friend, and he wrote 18 points. He says he argued with Muetzik Dolat around 18 points. Nobody knows what the 18 points are, but Rab Moshe Soloveitchik says, perhaps that, the idea of having a central rabbinic body that creates law and promulgates law, they were against it. Again, it's all revolving on the Talmud was the Talmud promulgated. So you realize that this argument that we're going to see in the history of the Talmud, how the Talmud came about, organic or top-down, deliberate or emerging, will make a difference in the politics. Do you have such a thing called Muetzik Tulatora, which runs today the Degel, you know that all of these parties are run by this, right? And this becomes an issue with not only outside of the Orthodox, group, but within the Orthodox community becomes an issue between Rabbi Chaim Brisker and Halevi, they were good friends. On this, they were split on the history of the Talmud. Is there such a thing as a central body? The Moshe Soloveitchik says that one of the issues Rabbi Chaim Soloveitchik in his 18 points that never became known, and you could read in my book, was perhaps that. Is there a central authority of the Talmud? Because it makes a big difference in the political model of the Aguda, because he realized that even the Mizrahi, when the Mizrahi comes, they get very affected by it. They say, wow, maybe we need that. Maybe we need this conclave of rabbis representing the rabbinic body to come with idea. We know that the natural evolvement of this was to give them Sanhedrin type powers, which is called Das Torah. Das Torah is this inspiration that the Sanhedrin had, right? The Sanhedrin was responsible not only in al they went to war, they declared war, they, they, they appointed the, 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 the king. If you believe that the Talmud created the pseudo Sanhedrin, I just told you, by this idea of promulgation of the Talmud and become the Sanhedrin, so you can see that if you have all the rabbis together, you could create a Sanhedrin. A Sanhedrin is not only responsible for al is responsible for political issues. So the history of the Talmud, how the Talmud comes about, becomes also a political manifesto. And that's the Chidush, that's the, and that's what I say in my book, and we're going to discuss in the third class, the scholarship and politics of the Talmud, which the rotation combines. So just to summarize, the history of the Talmud is paramount. You're going to see it's fascinating. There were only two people who really did the work, who went through the whole Talmud. It's Dave, uh, it's Hakazik Alevi in the Rotary Shredin, and it's fantastic. A real Talmudist respected with the historian, and he creates a model, and he addresses what history has to contribute. What we spoke, what is it? Interpretation, how to interpret the Talmud, how to view the document, levels of authority, but right, what's the authority of the Talmud? Was it an emergent? Was it put together? Devils of tradition versus innovation. How did the book evolve? 
right? How does tradition and innovation take place in the Talmud to allow us to create a dynamic going forward? And what's the politics? Is there such a thing as a political body created by assembly of rabbis? So these issues are addressed by Halevi. Professor David Weissalivni also combines uniquely that. He's the only one. He's a top Talmudist. Everybody knows he wrote Mikrotim Surah. Not only he wrote about the Talmud, he wrote a commentary on the Talmud, right? That's amazing. And he combined history. He always told me he's combining history. And he told me always, his chidush is not the Stamayim. People think the Stamayim. I always told him, where did he see, in other words, I told Halivni, when you have a street in Yerushalayim named Lachar Mevesri for Halivni, where is it going to be located? I asked him, is it going to be located in the German colony with all the historian Hershweiss and Gretz and so on? Or is it going to be in next to where we always ate, which is in the Café, Café Rimon? Café Rimon is the Rota Rishonim. Because he is uniquely not a historian, not a Talmudist. He's a combination of two. And we only have two people that I'm aware of who have the gravitas to really be that combination. It's Halevi and Halivni. And they actually were the ones who understood what's at stake. And what's at stake is amazing. Interpretation, authority, communal dynamics, and politics. And this is this combination that only these people could do it. So with the next two classes will be devoted, next class will be devoted to Professor David Weissalivni. And if you see here, you have sources. They will be available on my website, arybergman.com. You have all the sources. This is the sources on Professor Alivni's historical approach. And the third class is on my book, which is Itzhak Isaac Halevi, which is Halevi's historical model. So here we saw what's at stake in history. What is the real history? In a month, we'll see how Halevi sees the history. And in two months, we're going to see how Halevi sees the history. And as Jay Harris writes in my book, it's something interesting. We will never know really the history of the Talmud, unless you had a time capsule to go back you never know. But the Talmud is amazing because the Talmud left traces of history in the process. It is a Wikipedia that left traces of its development to give us clues about the history. So this becomes an investigative work, right? Combining history and Talmud to really find this history because I think the rabbis understood that unlocking the history has a lot at stake. So I think it will be a great journey. It's a journey of discovery. It's a journey of exploration. I thought there's no time capsule. And we're going to see two great people that really put their lives, they devoted their lives, they put everything at stake to understand the history of the Talmud. Next time is Halivni. Again, the source will be available as of um, next week. And hopefully to see next month. So thank you very much. We're going to open for questions. I see the chat. Thank you so much. Yes, I'm going to read out some of the questions to you, okay? Yes. So this is from Mitch Morrison. He wrote, if we approach the Talmud from a historical document, as well as religious slash folklore, etc., then how should we learn the commentaries like Rashi, Tosfot, Ran, Ritva, who look at the text much more linearly? This is a great question, okay? Hale, Hale, I, I will tell you, and we're going to discuss how Halivni deals with it and how Halevi deals, deals with it. Right? Halevi has his own approach because the Rishonim were not historians to explain how to deal with it and Halivni. So Professor Weiss Halivni, everybody knows that he says there are two things in the world. There's Torah Chaim and Torah Temet. Torah Temet is to know what it is. It's important to know, to understand. That's one thing. Then there is Torah Chaim, which is the way of life, how we are supposed to conduct ourselves. So the Talmud is a way of life. It was basically saw as a unitary, linear kind of an idea without a diachronic development. That's Torah Chaim, but Torah Temet is different. Halevi has another approach. We're going to learn it in the third class. And I have my own approach. I think that is amazing. I think that the Rishonim actually were aware of it. It is not true that they were not aware. They never spoke about it because they understood it, not cognitively, not 
consciously but subconsciously. But subconsciously it's all there. I'm going to show you. It, it's so interesting. If you understand, you see that they suddenly. And the one who was the most, and I give a class at YU on that, is the Rambam. The Rambam clearly addresses all of these issues. Because the Rambam, that's why the Rambam starts Mishneh Torah with a whole idea that it goes to the historical development, right? That the Talmud was done in Babylonia when the community was unified and then the community spread out. And in the Gionim, they didn't have the authority because they were splintered all over the place. Why does it do that? You're going to see it. it's fascinating. So I think that I told you, Halivni has one approach. I just told Torah to Torah Chaim. We're going to see Halevi, how he has. And I'll tell you, that many Rishonim were very aware. They never spoke on it clearly, deliberately, but subconsciously they were. They were very aware of the issues. I think that in my book, I prove it, and I'm now actually writing a second book, that the Rambam was very aware of it, Rashi was very aware of it, the Rach was very aware of it, and the Rif. So they, they were aware of it. So in other words, I don't think they saw. I think that today people vest them a linear approach, but that's not true. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, this one is from Gabi Newman. He yes. wrote, where is the consensus for the issues and sugyot of the Talmud? In other words, how did we arrive at conclusions as to who prevails in the machloket or dialogue of the sugya? That came after Ravashi, no? Who we could have been to... responsible for the conclusions of machloket? It's a great question, but we're going to see the history. So we didn't do that. This is a very interesting thing because exactly on this levels of authority, it's a discussion between Halevi, Halivni, and I'll tell you my theory. Now, that, those are the important issues. That's a great question. But that question is, again, levels of authority. It's predicated about the history of the Talmud. If you don't know the history, you can never know that. But if you see the models of Halivni, he'll give you, we're going to learn it next, in next month, and then we're going to learn how Halevi deals with it, do we store it? And if I have time, I'll tell you how I think, and uh, I have a very cool way of looking at it, but that's extremely important. That question will be addressed, needs to be addressed, and only history can address. Wonderful. Are there any other questions? Please feel free to unmute yourself or write in the chat. Anybody, any questions? Any comments? See, the goal of this class and this presentation is that once you understand the history of the time and what's at stake, your learning will never be the same. You're going to see some, the, all these questions are fascinating. You understand, again, this idea that the Rishonim were not aware of it is only one approach. But if you really understand the history and the development, applying all the new theories in the process, you'll see that they were very aware, sometimes cognitively, sometimes subconsciously. But the, hopefully the goal is to show you that uh, Something which is very interesting. I read another question from Mitch Morrison. Yes. Said, Do we know if Jewish masses accepted this conclave of rabbis or was there distinctive worlds between the rabbinic sages, most of whom were presum presumably literate and the illiterate masses? Or did the rabbis have public acceptance? We are going to see that because, again, this is a question that needs to be addressed and will be addressed, right? Because the question is how the rabbinic the, 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 uh, community was in Babylonia. We know that in the beginning, I think that was unique, and I address in my book, I'm actually writing a book, which is not academic, but is GPS, right? It's academic style. is academic, is non-academic for a intellectually inquisitive audience. It's called the Talmud from conversation to text. And part of it is that, right? Why in Babylonia in the third century, there was such a shift into a rabbinic, more academic learning, right? That influenced the community. And I want to show that in the political side, there was a unique time in Babylonia that people basically, rabbinic authority became very valuable and very accepted. And the reason is because it has to do with the zeitgeist in the sustainable community. So what you ask, which is so true, but this, and you see that a guy like uh, many professors, right? And Seth does that, uh, that uh, there was a different community, which was not rabbinic and etc. The Talmud throughout says, but there was a very much of a real a religious power of the Magi and the people in the Zoroastrian societies in that time. So in other words, in the third century in Babylonia, there was a very much of a movement of the power, 
that the monarchy of the Sasanians became so successful in conjunction with the religious powers of the Magi, of the, the Magush, what we call the Magush, and money, they become very powerful. So there was, and that's what the Rambo tries to say, that that was a unique time in Babylonia from the third century all the way to perhaps the eighth or ninth century. So it, it is, even though technically, technically, it didn't have to speak this way, but I think, at least my impression, that if you study the influence of the general society, there was a very unique time in Babylon, and perhaps unique from ever. Now, it doesn't matter that, doesn't mean that everybody was rabbinic, city of Mahuza, there were so many cities that they were quote unquote independent thinkers, but no, but the vast majority, because the society there was this way the clergy had huge power within the Sasanian movement. And clearly that has an impact on the Jewish community. We have one more question. This is going to be the last, this is going to be the last question for the evening from Avi Green. Why is there no English translation of Doro Tarishonim? And also why assume a single conclave instead of a number of them in various generations? Excellent question, Avi. Number one, there's no translation because the book in Hebrew, nobody knows about it. And the reason is threefold. Number one, we're going to discuss because the Chazonish tactically gave at least, and we will talk in my book, we're going to discuss it together. He gave at least, he told the children not to reprint the book. So the book has not, was not reprinted. You can almost find it in Hebrew. So the Chazonish told not to reprint the book. We're going to talk why. Okay, so that's number one. So the religious, so it, the book felt for the Orthodox, he, the book was suppressed and for the non-traditionalists thought the book was only apologetics. So therefore there's no translation because the Hebrew was not there. Number two, the book is very difficult. It's written in a very difficult Hebrew and it, it contradicts itself. It is a lot of work. It's a lot of work to understand what it says in Hebrew. And I don't think many people understand it. Imagine to translate it makes it almost impossible. And number three, the structure of the book doesn't even lend itself to translate. So people adopted the book. The book was adopted by people, but in many ways, right or wrong. So the adaptions are translated. Let's see, our school just put out the, a book on the um, introduction to the Talmud. It's based on their understanding of the Dorotar Shonim, but I read my book, they have many misunderstandings that they are basing themselves. So second-hand derivative books in English on the Dorotar Shonim, many out there. Our school's introduction to the Talmud, Hyman's Todot Adem Bimurim, I can list you many. So many of the traditional Jewish sources, including, including many of the quote-unquote historians on the traditional committee, they rely on the Rotary Shanim, but they wrote the Shanim in a very superficial way. So that's why. And now why a single conclave? Because for it to be authoritative, it had to include all the rabbis of the generation. And for that, you need a historic person to do that. Ravashi is the only one who had the gravitas because of his longevity because of his power, because he was a very rich person. He was very close to, as we know, to the Sasanians. The Sasanians allowed him to do it. And Halevi, Halevi is a genius because he's able to prove from the Talmudic text that Ravashi did such work. So technically it could have been, and we're going to see that Halevi allows for the court of Ravashi to extend for a period of time. But the only person at the gravitas to do that was Ravashi, who could put all the rabbis together, imagine. Number two, he had the clout to do that. He lived long enough to do that. And most important, Halevi is able to find your traits. I told you, that one doesn't tell its history. You have to do investigative work. The only one he was able to find such traces and very cleverly is Ravashi. Could it technically be more generations? The answer is yes, but very difficult because we just don't see that. Okay, so even Halevi would have to agree to that. They, we don't see that. So that, that, that's why. And we're going to see that even Halevi agrees that the, the, the court of Ravashi had to extend beyond this death. Otherwise, the chronology doesn't work. So even though it was one court, but it extended over multiple lifetimes. That's how Halevi is going to say. So if you have the conclave, 
it has to be authoritative enough. And all the Rishonim, we know that, they always give to Ravashi. They took Ravashi as the, quote-unquote, the pedigree of the Talmud Ravashi. Rambam in the beginning of Mishnah Torah. Uh, Rashi says, all over Ravashi, the Rosh. And the question is what Ravashi did. So Ravashi had this aura as giving the authority, the pedigree to the Talmud, because he, he was strong enough, big enough, accepted enough, long enough with the cloud. So that's why. Technically, could be more, but just nobody could do. Halevi, Halevi writes that the Hashgacha, the God wanted one person to do that. That people, basically, that he was accepted by everybody, and that's also unique. That's why, why there was never a Talmud again, try to put everybody together. <laughs> So the only person who was able to do that was Ravashi. Okay, thank you very much. A great night to everybody. Hopefully you'll be able to, from next week on, you'll be able to download the sources from ariebergman.com. And uh, I hope to see everybody back in a month from now. Yes, thank you so much, everybody, for being here. I just want to mention that if you registered for the first uh, class, then you're registered for all of them. So we're going to send out a reminder email with the Zoom link a few days before the next class on July 13th, same time. I'm going to send the link, the registration link in the chat for those of you who want to share that with your friends or family who might be interested in the event. And again, before we close, I just want to share in the chat, again, a thank you to our sponsors of this program. Thank you so much for being with us this evening. And thank you, Rabbi Dr. Ari Bergman for a really fantastic year. My pleasure. Thank you very thank much. You so much. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye, let's talk. Bye-bye.